I'm here with uh, the legendary Jean-Jacques Perret, and uh, Jean-Jacques has uh, kindly granted us some time to interview for our music. Uh, but before I ask you the question, Jean-Jacques, can you introduce me to your assistant? Oh. Hey. Hmm. Let me introduce myself. I am Jean-Jacques Perret, assistant. By the way, I do everything myself. He, he is not the artist. It's me, the artist. <laughs> Mickey, I told you many times to keep quiet. Okay. <laughs> so that was DJ Mickey Star, my assistant. <laughs> well, John, just to kick off, you attended medical school in 1949, mm -hmm. and during that time, you met the pioneer of electronic music. Georges Genet, mm -hmm. who invented the ondoline. So can you tell me how you met him? Well, it was when I was listening a radio program and I heard that a man just invented a revolutionary uh, instrument able to do uh, the sounds of violin, and trombone, bassoon, oboe, Backpipes, etc., etc. I said, violin. So I am going to be able to play violin with a keyboard. I can't believe it. So I got in touch with the radio station and asked them the telephone number of uh, Georges Henry. And I said, I am very interested by uh, your instrument and I would like to play it. He said, okay. So uh, come to my my uh, workshop, because it was a little workshop, and uh, I met him. I asked him if I could rent one instrument to to become uh, acquainted to him, to it. And then uh, he said, uh, you know, I don't rent the, uh, the ondulin, but I give you one, and you will get it back when you will be ready. And if, uh, if you make progresses on it, we'll talk. Okay, so I went home with my treasure, put it beside the piano and I had the idea to play the melody on the violin with the right hand and the accompaniment on the piano of the left hand. So I... Uh, came back to George Jenny six months later and he said, okay, so show me what, what you do. And uh, I said, oh, yes, you have a piano? Yes, of course. Come in the salon, in the living room. I have a big shiny one. So I put the handling close to the piano and I started to demonstrate to him what I could do with the piano and the violin. And he was very impressed. He said, well, that's a good idea. So he said, if you want, you can, I can offer you to be uh, the official demonstrator. So I give you a salary. I give you a percentage on the violin that I will sell you thanks to you, and I think you are going to make a good living. Oh, I said, that's wonderful. So he gave me an ondulin for good, and I started to play in the big conventions, fairs, of all over Europe, in Milano, in Stockholm, in uh, well, many, many fairs, and uh, I, by the way, I sold a lot. I took the order for the and I sent it to, to Jenny. And he said, well, be careful because you know, I can only make an ondulin one week. So I said, I have about 12 orders. Oh, he said, so okay, I'm going to, uh, 
to get some people to help me to build the Andelin. And it was like that until I did my acts around the world in 80 ways. Being so impressed with the Andelin as, as a musical instrument, can you tell me what in particular made it special? The Andelin, I still have one now which is working because it has been restored. But this instrument was very special to me because you could get the attack and also the vibrato directly on the keyboard. And this was a very, uh, very important improvement in the electronic music. And I still use now, when I do a record, I still use also the Andelin. How did using the Andelin influence your own musical ideas? And do you consider it to be restrictive or liberating? Well, for me, it was not restrictive, of course. It was a plus. And uh, I was liberated that I could play something else than piano or organ. And at this time, we did not have many synthesizers except uh, the uh, trotonium, the, uh, the ceremon, and, uh, and that's all. And that was for me a plus. I started to do record for a label called Pacific. You could hear that there are several on the ring. But I was only the one to play because I used the technique of Les Paul re-recording on top of each track. So, after, after the, the track was recorded, we added live musicians for the accompaniment. And it was, uh, it was the first record, the very first record I made by myself in, uh, in the 50s, before going to America. Was there resistance or excitement from people to accept this new electronic music technology being the Andrea? They were amazed. But something, you know, it was, it was not considered as a serious instrument to belong to an orchestra because uh, this instrument was something too, too new to be accepted by the musicians. And besides, for the musicians, it was they were afraid that we would record bassoon or oboe sounds and that would uh, keep the musician away from the sessions. So I, sometimes I explain that is not the true sound, it is an imitation. So don't, uh, don't be afraid of being replaced by the Andiolin. You mentioned that you still own and play your Andiolin. How reliable do you find that machine and, and how difficult is she to keep working? It is very difficult to uh, have it still working because when the, the components are rusting, then it doesn't work so good in, anymore. I think that many, there are many Andiolins, but they are in the attics or in the cave because the people can't play it anymore. And it is very difficult to, uh, to restore an Andiolin, but I was lucky enough to find a man in Paris who is a fan of electronic music and analog uh, instruments. And he can replace he can replace a lot of things in the in the keyboard. So the violin, my own violin is still on 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 its on its road to to, to be uh, operative. It's still operative. <laughs> Invited and sponsored to go to America in 1960 by Carol Bratman, and you then had access to a unique experimental recording studio owned by Carol. Can you describe the key experimental instruments you used and how this influenced your music from that time? I remember uh, Carol as all the uh, 
all the material to do uh, the right things uh, to work with the Angelin, like the LMI, which was uh, electronic, you know, and also uh, many organs. The 60 was the beginning of bubbling about electronic instruments. So he got everything he could and put it in my studio. And that's why I could uh, make this uh, special commercials. I uh, got with Gershon Kingsley an award in 1968. I still have a little golden statue. <laughs> All right. And it was for local, local uh, drink. Before you went to America, you were experimenting with music concrete sounds to develop your own unique style of music. So can you tell me how this technology influenced you? That was the story about Pierre Schaeffer when uh, I saw him to demonstrate in his studio for him. He had a, a bunch of pupils to learn how to make loops with, for for experimental uh, music concrete. And I said to Pierre Schaeffer, I want to do a, a record because I am due to go to America and I would like to develop a technique of music concrete but smaller smaller sounds in order to make to make humoristic music. You know, he said, well, that's impossible, you can't, uh, because experimental music concrete is very serious, so uh, you will never succeed in this venture. It is reserved to contemporary music, serious, serious contemporary music. I said, okay, but I will send you a tape of uh, what happened. So a few years after I was in America and was successful with uh, Vanguard, and um, also the commercials, I sent him a cassette of an excerpt of all these things and I added a little letter and I said, this is what I did with uh, sound concrete, concrete sound. And I never received any answer from him. Never saw him again. The process of tape splicing and mixing that is concrete must have been enormously time consuming and I, I guess you must have made thousands of tapes over the years so especially for the benefit of my customers watching this video can you just explain what music concrete is and, and do you still have your original library i am my original library because i copied each sound on a curzweil memory so i have all my sounds saved for a long time I hope. And this splicing time is very time consuming. But now you can we can do it with a computer. But at this time we did not have a computer. So I had to find a way to uh, to make this loop with tape and also something very important. When I made the loop after each sound, before the other one, I left a millimeter of blank tape in order not to be messy, but precise. Only one millimeter. So you see that added more work to, <laughs> uh, to splice a one millimeter, because I had to be very precise on the time, since it was loops. It has to be uh, in tempo. So I measured and uh, with a special rule the exact uh, the exact length of each phrase, and I had sometimes to be careful not to uh, to go more because it would have made uh, a, a false rhythm. So it has to be the same, all the same. I had to. So that's why it was time consuming and the flight of the bumblebee B I did. Uh, every, every bar was measured 
and at the same, exactly the same length. Exactly. Do you think modern samplers have now removed the need to, to use tape splicing as a technique? To use samples for my composition, it has to be humoristic. But the modern sampling has uh, helped a lot to remove the need of uh, the time spicing technique because it is uh, the, the little the little uh, millimeter of tape must be taken into consideration when you make the loop on the computer. So you have to to uh, to cut one one square on the on the computer in order to make a loop which means something. Roger, can you tell me what was the catalyst for your first meeting with Robert Moog? I heard one time a record. I think that was uh, uh, Gershon Kingsley bought it to me to listen, and I heard the first work of, at this time, Walter Carlos, as known as Wendy Carlos now. So I said. This sounds it's fantastic. We must get a MOOC synthesizer. We must get it. We did not have much, much money. We asked Carol to, to help us. Carol said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And he bought the... He had a lot of trust in me because he was feeling that we were going to do a, fantastic things. And Carol bought a Moog synthesizer, the big one, the, the first one, one of the first ones, and bring it himself and show us, Gershon and I, how to operate it. And I must, I must admit that Gershon was much gifted than me for the, for the Moog, but after uh, with experimentation, I started to be used to it. So, what were your feelings about the new synthesizer you used for the, your collaborative work with Gershon Kingsley? Uh, in terms of its complexity, to what had you been using until that time? I said, what am I going to do with this machine? I don't even know how to operate it. Gershon Kingsley was... Uh, in advance with me because he understood much better than me and also visited Robert Moog and then Robert Moog, I called him one day and I said now explain to me, let me know how this, this machine is, must be operated so he, he showed it to me in details and now after, after a while I understood you worked on a number of important projects using the MOOC synthesizer at the time, so can you describe these to me? At the same time I did commercials, at the same time I did uh, many, many things. Uh, after we did the, the two records at Vanguard with Gershon, then we split and I had to do two more. The, third record called the Amazing Electronic Pop Sound of Robert Perret and also Moog Indigo and in Moog Indigo I had the luck to make a hit which you can still hear on commercials in America and it also has been sampling, sampled about 50 times by DJs <laughs> and that, that was a big hit and also with Kingsley, we had the luck to have one of our uh, uh, track called Dark Way Down, chosen by Walt Disney uh, uh, six years after Disney left us. They decided to, to use Dark Way Down, the scene of the, the main street electrical parade. And my friend Don Dorsey did a wonderful 
arrangement, orchestral arrangement, using in the background, but present the Baroque way down. Did you ever perform live stage work with the Moog synthesizer? Yes, I, I did. I did on stage with uh, Luke Weibert uh, playing Frère Jacques. Eh? Ah, he said, maybe you don't know Frère Jacques. You want to hear Frère Jacques? No, okay. please. Are you playing it? So perfect, Mickey, eh? Did you ever work with Bob, Bob Mood, to produce a custom synthesizer or module just for your needs as a musician? No, I did not have the, the occasion. We did not have the occasion to meet together for anything. Uh, since I was not a technician, I would not been, I would not have been very helpful in this matter for him. So I let him did what he had to he had to do and uh, I was the one who followed also the the life of the Moog developing uh, every every year and I used it in my uh, in my records. What aspects of using modular synthesizers or modular synthesis did you enjoy the most? <laughs> well it is always the first one. Because it reminds me this uh, monster, gigantesque monster of uh, that I had uh, that I, I used to tune all the time because it went out of tune. But I had so much fun of it, uh, with it, and also uh, the last one, the Voyager version, which is very good. This one replaces the, all the all the other, and you can do a lot of things with it, and it's wonderful. Nothing can replace the mood. I am always so happy with the result I get with the mood that most of the time I use mood. Analog synthesizers, both vintage and modern, still contribute heavily to today's music. So, can you tell me why you think this is so? You can compare between a vinyl record, you know, a gallet, and a CD record. It is not the same sound. The, the first one has something special because it is read by a diamond. And the other one is done electronically and it is a little bit cold. That's why I, I always suggest to people who ask me the question, or to new uh, listeners who want to make electronic music, try to incorporate in your in your work as much as possible live sound to make it more uh, attractive. Because you can make a mistake, the ear doesn't make mistakes. So you have to uh, practice it, boss. To have it, boss. It, it is the best way to have a good, successful record. Do you think the, the preset nature of modern music technology dilutes the need to explore and experiment with sound? Well, you know, I am not a kind of preset man. I want to find the sounds I want, but create it, not preset by, you know, uh, 
by Beckham's. Uh, the true musician is aware in his head what he, he wants to do. So he has to choice to choose instead of preset yes. Like the almond organ, for instance. The preset almond organ, you have several preset possibilities. But I like to find myself the harmonics of the almond. Do you believe that because so many modern digital keyboards, workstations are now uh, professionally loaded with patches that people can just play them without thinking and creating or being experimental. Do you think that dilutes what's happening when people experimenting or not? It's saving time, but approximative sound. So from the preset sounds, you have to find yourself the expression more uh, uh, high uh, or more uh, long uh, it depends of what kind of sound it is but you have to find it yourself not the machine the machine is is a robot you just push a button and it gives you the the generality of the sound but you have to do it yourself it is important for a musician what do you think is the future of electronic or pop music considering the major influences in dance and hip hop in today's charts. You know, when something happens, like a discovery, everybody jumps on it. Okay. But for the future, I think it's going to increase. You know, the problem with the, for instance, the techno music. The techno music, the push button and they let the machine do it. It's a, exactly the contrary of what I'm doing, except some very talented uh, musicians who are doing techno, very good techno music. But I'm not so involved in techno because I'm too old now uh, and I have to, uh, to keep a little bit uh, the taste of the, of the past. Maybe it is nostalgia, I don't know. But I think that the future will continue to be with electronic sounds. And also, at the same time, uh, analog instruments will come and join together the electronic. That is up to the composer now to try to make it uh, both way, both way. And this is, this is important for the, for the future. If you had to live on a desert island, what instrument would you take with you if you could only have one and why? Well, of course I could not take an electric instrument working with electricity because in a desert island I would not play, I would not be able to play this. Let's pretend there was. Pedal power. Pedal. Oh, if there is sea power. Yeah. Uh, if we have the possibility of feeding him with electricity, <laughs> of course it will be the Andelin and the Moon. Together. <laughs> okay, Jean Jacques, thank you very much. I'd like to thank you and, of course, your invaluable assistant. That's all. Okay. I say goodbye to all my friends. Goodbye. I am the star, I am the star, I am the star.